I'm kind of going to just, if it's okay, I'm going to give an overview of just some 2023 really new updates in metastatic breast cancer. Um, and then I'm also going to um, talk a little bit about brain metastasis. And there's some spurts of brain metastasis sort of throughout the, the presentation, if that's okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. And these are... Um, just kind of a high level overview of updates in metastatic breast cancer um, in 2023. We just had our national meeting, which is kind of San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium is the breast cancer meeting every year in Texas where a lot of the new breast cancer data um, is presented. So we learn a lot about new drugs, new therapies, um, that that may be you know useful. So a lot of this um, is based on what we saw at San Antonio this past year. Um, these are my disclosures. I do a lot of clinical trials um, with different drug companies. I try to work with as many people as I can so that I'm not biased and I'm simply choosing what is the best thing for the patient. And I'm not you know married to one company um, more than the other. Um, and I just wanted to just kind of briefly talk, you know, I'm sure that this is a, a group that knows a lot about metastatic breast cancer, who does their own research and really takes that into their own hands. But I just wanted to go through a few terms that I'll be using um, that you may hear your doctors use or you may hear in my presentation. So when I talk about progression, um, what I mean by that is when you're on a treatment for your metastatic breast cancer and we're doing scans regularly and we either see new areas of growth or we see the areas that are already there have grown by about 30% or more. Um, and so I will, um, that's what I'm talking about when I talk about progression. When you see data from clinical trials, they will talk a lot about progression-free survival. And what that means is it's a clinical trial term for the average amount of time that each patient had, median amount of time that all of the patients on the trial had until their breast cancer progressed or, or grew. Um, and it's usually in months. If we're lucky, it's in years, um, but it's usually reported in months. Um, and I'm also going to talk about some mutations um, which, are, which guide us in determining what treatments may benefit uh, women with metastatic breast cancer. And what mutations are is their alterations or changes in the DNA of your tumor which may impact the tumor's growth. And over the last few decades, we've done lots of studies trying to figure out if there are treatments that we can specifically target um, those mutations with, and, and we're learning more and more about that. So you'll see some of those themes come through today. So first and foremost, I'm gonna talk about updates in metastatic estrogen receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancer, or you might hear hormone receptor positive. If you hear hormone receptor positive or estrogen receptor positive, those are the same things. And, and this is really 70 to 80% um, of all breast cancer and all metastatic breast cancer. So I would imagine that, that this, this category would encompass a lot of you on this call. Um, in, the last, um, in the last decade, we have learned a lot about a class of drugs called CDK4-6 inhibitors. And we usually use CDK4-6 inhibitors, which are abemocyclib, palbocyclib, or ribocyclib. And the brand names for those drugs are Ibrance, Kiswali, and Verzenio. Um, now in newly diagnosed metastatic breast cancer patients with hormone receptor positive breast cancer, most of us are using these drugs in the first line setting with endocrine therapy, and that is still the same. So most patients with new metastatic breast cancer, unless they're very, very ill or have very, very aggressive disease, will get a, a CDK4-6 inhibitor with endocrine therapy. And that's pretty standard, and we've known that for a few years. 
But what happens next, so patients stay on these CDK4-6 inhibitors for oftentimes years. Um, the average amount of time to be on a CDK4-6 inhibitor is about two years. So that means that half the patients are not on for that long and half the patients are on for longer. But after first line treatment, you know, the really the open questions in hormone receptor positive breast cancer are what do we do after your disease progresses on a CDK4-6 inhibitor? Um, and so that is kind of a new area for us. And some of the open questions that we've asked and are starting to answer um, by clinical trials that I'm going to present to you is what patients after a CDK4-6 inhibitor can just have endocrine therapy by itself? So that's one question. And then which patients um, should have an endocrine therapy with another targeted therapy? That's another question that we ask. And which is the best therapy to choose after you have progression on a CDK4-6 inhibitor? And which patients should initiate chemotherapy right after their CDK4? That's another question that we've been asking ourselves. Um, and sorry, I'm not going to check the chat so until the end. So if you have any questions, okay. really just feel free to interrupt. Um, so there are there is a lot of research going on in new endocrine therapies. So the endocrine therapies that we usually give with the CDK4-6 inhibitor are aromatase inhibitors like Arimidex or Famara or Aromacin or Fulvestrin. There's tons of research going on trying to find endocrine therapies that might be better than those. And this is a really busy slide, but these are all the types of different, so aromatase inhibitors are what we often give in the adjuvant setting and in the clinic. Um, and there's new generations that are being studied in tons of clinical trials. There's what uh, drugs that we call SERMs, um, which bind estrogen in a tissue dependent way. So they increase estrogen in some tissues and decrease it in other tissues. A huge area of research right now is oral SERDs. So SERDs are very fulvestrant, for example, is a SERD, but there's tons of um, research going on looking at pills that are better than fulvestrant, but are the same class of drugs. So there's uh, four different um, oral SERDs in the clinic. And then the newer drugs that we won't see in the clinic for a while are called Protax and Sirens. Um, but there, this is just to show you that there's still a lot of research going on to figure out if there are better ways that we can target estrogen than, than what we use now. Now, we have one clinical trial that was called the Emerald Clinical Trial, which is a phase three. So phase three trials are very large. And in phase three trials, um, you're almost always trying to go for FDA approval, meaning that um, if the trial is positive, and the FDA reviews it and approves it, then this drug could be given to any woman who qualified in the United States. And so this was a phase three registrational clinical trial called Emerald of patients with hormone receptor positive breast cancer who had one to two lines of prior endocrine therapy. They could have had up to one line of chemotherapy um, and they were randomized and they all had to have a CDK4-6 inhibitor in the past. So every single patient had progressed on Ibrant, or Cusquale, or Verzenio. And they were randomized um, to either Elicestrant, which is a new oral SERD, or investigator's choice um, endocrine therapy, which could have been fulvestrant or anastrozole, letrozole, or, or eczemestane. And the primary endpoint was progression-free survival, so the amount of time until their cancer progressed in the overall population, but also progression-free survival in patients that had mutations in the estrogen gene, which is called ESR1. And what we found from this trial is that l did work better than fulvestrin. Um, so about 25% of the patients were still on l at 12 months, whereas only 9% of the patients were still on fulvestrin um, at 12 months. And it was, it was better um, when we looked at it statistically as well. Um, but the patients that had these mutations in the estrogen gene, these ESR1 mutations, 
did even better with the L assessment. So the ones, the ones on the bottom are the patients that had ESR1 mutations and about, you know, 30% of the patients that had an ESR1 mutation were still on this drug alone at a year. And the reason why that's important to us is, you know, we'd love to be able to find an endocrine therapy that patients can just take by itself. Because when you start combining endocrine therapies with other drugs like Everolimus or Alpelisib or, you know, an array of different drugs, we start to see more side effects. Um, so if there are patients that could just have this l drug by itself, that would be great. It's very well tolerated. It has very minimal nausea. Um, other than that, there are almost no side effects. So about 10% of patients have nausea. Um, that's that's generally mild and otherwise it's very well tolerated. So what we learned this year at San Antonio are the people that had the best outcomes on l were the people who were on their CDK4-6 inhibitor the longest. So if you look at the box on the right, those patients that had were on their CDK4-6 inhibitor for more than a year without progression and those patients who had an ESR1 mutation, so both, they were on this drug by itself for an average of almost nine months, whereas they were only on the fulvestrin for two months. So fulvestrin did not work in any of these patients very well at all. So another thing that we've learned from these trials is that just giving fulvestrin by itself or an aromatase inhibitor by itself after progression on a CDK4-6 inhibitor does not work very well. For most patients, there's always outliers. But what we learned about this l is that patients who had an ESR1 mutation and were on their CDK4-6 inhibitor for more than a year had, had pretty good outcomes on it. Um, half the patients were, 60% of the patients were still on it at six months, 30% of the patients were still on it at 18 months. And so that might be a really good option for patients who are on their CDK4-6 inhibitor for a long time and patients who had an ESR1 mutation. And so I would say that this l drug, which is, I'll, my, my next slide will show it, but the FDA has to decide on l in just, um, just two weeks time. So we're gonna hear if l is approved by the FDA in two weeks. And um, it would be a good option for patients that were on their CDK4-6 inhibitor for a long time, um, more than 12 months, and patients who had an ESR1 mutation. Um, and I do just want to stop there and see if anybody has any questions about that, because the FDA is going to decide whether or not to approve this drug on February 17th, and most of us think that they probably will approve this drug. Um, it's also in several clinical trials combined with other drugs that we use for metastatic breast cancer. And for, you know, it's also in two clinical trials in patients that have brain metastasis because we think that this drug um, is brain penetrant. Um, so it's in two clinical trials, and I put the NCT numbers here in with, given with a bemocyclib in patients that have active brain metastasis because we think that the drug is brain penetrable. Um, okay, so another thing that we learned about at San Antonio was another oral CERD from AstraZeneca. It's called camizestrant. It also looks much better than fulvestrant. Um, it's not nearly as far along as alicestrant, which goes in front of the FDA in two weeks. Um, we saw here again that it really works much it works better than fulvestrant mostly in patients that have these ESR1 mutations. So as you can see, the mutational profiles are becoming very important. Um, and so you know the oral SIRDs are looking quite good in patients that have ESR1 mutations. And just so you know, about 40 to 50 percent of patients after progression on a CDK4-6 inhibitor will have one. So it's a pretty good proportion of patients that will, and it's important that we start testing. So how and when should I get tested for an ESR1 mutation? Well, ESR1 mutations are now probably a marker of which patients may benefit 
from these newer endocrine therapies after progression on a CDK4-6 inhibitor. And ESR1 mutations really in general don't happen in early stage breast cancer. Newly diagnosed breast cancer, only about 4% of patients have them. So they're very rare from the onset, but almost 30 to 40 to 45% of patients have them after progression on a CDK4-6 inhibitor. So what I do in my patients that are progressing on a CDK4-6 inhibitor is I generally either get a tumor biopsy or I send circulating tumor DNA and I do next generation sequencing with some platform that has an ESR1 mutation and a PI3 kinase mutation in it. Um, there are an array of different ones and every doctor probably uses different ones. Um, but, you know, you could just ask your doctor, say, after you progress on a CDK4-6 inhibitor, do you think it's important that we look and see, you know, what mutations I might have that may help us guide therapy? So what about combination strategies after CDK4-6 inhibitor? Should I continue iBrantz with a different endocrine therapy partner after I have progression on iBrantz? So this question of, should I continue a CDK4-6 inhibitor after progression on a CDK4-6 inhibitor has come up by a lot of people in the last five years. And we now have two clinical trials, at least with palbocyc with iBrantz after iBrantz and Kisqually after iBrantz that are giving us a little bit of insight. So the PACE clinical trial was presented at San Antonio this year. And patients that had hormone receptor positive breast cancer that had progression on their CDK4-6 inhibitor were randomized to either fulvestrin by itself, fulvestrin plus iBrantz. So they had to be on an aromatase inhibitor with a CDK4-6 inhibitor. So, and then they either got fulvestrin, they got fulvestrin with iBrantz, or they got fulvestrin with iBrantz and an immunotherapy. And almost all of the patients had iBrantz. So all they did was they continued their iBrantz, but they switched the endocrine therapy to fulvestrin. Sadly, we saw no benefit at all um, in continuing palbocyclib with fulvestrin versus continuing fulvestrin alone. So what this told us is once you progress on iBrantz, we need to stop it. We should not continue it with another endocrine therapy. Um, the immunotherapy data was intriguing. The patients that got immunotherapy did a little bit better. It was a really small study. So this is something that would need to be repeated in larger studies, but it was interesting and, and intriguing. And I think we'll see a lot more immunotherapy studies because of this. But what about if you progress on iBrands and your doctor decides to switch you to, Kis, uh, to Kisqually, so which is ribocyclib? So this is the results of the maintained study, which is ribocyclib after progression on palbocyclib. And what we saw was marginal benefits from continuing ribocyclib over endocrine therapy alone. So the patients on the right in the maintained study that got fulvestrin after progression on iBrantz had a median progression-free survival of 2.8 months, which is not very good. Whereas if they added ribocyclid to that, it was more like five and a half months. So there was very trivial benefits of continuing uh, ribocyclib after palbocyclib. And it's personally not something that I'm doing in my practice. Something that I'm more excited about is actually a bemocyclib after progression on um, after progression on Kisqually or um, or iBrands. So this is the results of the phase two Elaine two study, which was a bemocyclib plus a new drug called lasofoxifene in patients who had ESR1 mutant hormone receptor positive breast cancer after progression on iBrands. And the median progression free survival here was more than a year. So, you know, the last one I showed you two months, five months, not super exciting. This was 56 weeks, and it's now more like 60 weeks, and 70% of the patients were on abemocyclib and lasofoxifene for more than 24 weeks. And this is 
to be clear though, this is only patients that have this ESR1 mutation, which is about 40% of patients where we think this might be a good opportunity. And these are um, four ongoing clinical trials. And Andrea, I would, you know, if you have progression on iBrands and you're really looking to see if you can continue another CDK4-6 inhibitor, I would implore you to try to find one of these trials. I mean, they're at many, many, many sites across the country because the question is an open question. Personally, I think that abemacyclib is going to be the best uh, CDK4-6 inhibitor after progression on iBrands. And there's three phase three, so registrational phase three, going for FDA approval, clinical trials that I've noted here that are looking at abemacyclib after uh, progression on iBrands. Um, we're opening a lane three at Dana-Farber soon. This is um, patients that have ESR1 mutations, um, the one that had a progression-free survival of 56 weeks that I showed you. Post Monarch, we have open at Dana Farber and it's open at many, many sites. Um, and Ember 3 is also another study with um, Eli Lilly's oral CERD with abemacyclib. They're enrolling 800 patients. Um, so, all very large trials that are trying to answer this question. Are these Did only I... for ESR1? Mutations? No. So Elaine 3 is only for ESR1 mutants. Ember 3 and Post Monarch are anybody with progression on iBrands. Yeah. So generally we use aromatase inhibitors in the first line unless the patient has had progression on an aromatase inhibitor. So if you were receiving an aromatase inhibitor for stage one, two, or three breast cancer and you develop metastasis and you're on the aromatase inhibitor, then we would give fulvestrant in the first line setting with a CDK4-6 inhibitor. Otherwise, if you're far out from your adjuvant aromatase inhibitor or your new diagnosis, we're gonna give you an aromatase inhibitor in the first line. And we've actually looked and seen if fulvestrant is better than an aromatase inhibitor in the first line for patients that haven't had an AI. And the answer is actually that the AI is better than fulvestrant in the first line. Um, if you've never had an AI or you've, it's been a long time since you've had your AI. Um, so fulvestrin is the one that we use after progression on an aromatase inhibitor. And so it's the standard kind of second line um, endocrine therapy. And we're now developing many more drugs that are looking better than fulvestrin, which is, which is good. And abemacyclib is Rosenio, yes. Would it be helpful if I use brand names, everybody? It doesn't, I'll just try to use both. Um, so another question that we ask ourselves in hormone receptor positive breast cancer is after progression on a CDK4-6 inhibitor is, does the patient have a mutation in PI3, pic 3 ca So this is another thing that can be tested on your tumor or in your blood through circulating tumor DNA. Um, and about 40% of patients will have a PI3 kinase mutation. We have a drug that is specifically approved in patients with PI3 kinase mutations, and it's called Picre or Alpelisib. Um, and some patients do fine on that drug, but most patients have a lot of really bad side effects on that drug. Um, I don't know if anybody in the group has, but I can tell you that it's as a doctor, it's not particularly easy to give. There's an 80% incidence of, of diabetes, there's rash, there's, um, there's all kinds of terrible things, and, and we're looking for better drugs. So this year, um, at San Antonio, just really a month ago, we had um, this clinical trial result, which was the phase three Capitello 291 clinical trial, which took patients that had metastatic breast cancer that was hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative. They could have had up to two lines of prior endocrine therapy. They could have had up to one line of chemotherapy. Most of the patients had a prior CDK4-6 inhibitor, so about 70% of them did. None of them had had prior fulvestrin um, or everolimus, and they couldn't have bad diabetes, but they could have prediabetes or early diabetes. And they randomized them to a new drug called capavisertib, which is an AKT inhibitor, 
which targets the same pathway as PI3 kinase um, with full vestrin or placebo plus full vestrin. And the primary endpoint was progression-free survival in the overall population and patients that had mutations in either PI3 kinase, AKT, or P10. And essentially, patients that got Kapavasertib with fulvestrin did twice as had progression-free survival twice as long as patients that just got fulvestrin by itself. You can see patients that got fulvestrin by itself had a median progression-free survival of only about three and a half months, whereas if they got capavacertib, it was more like seven and a half months, so kind of a doubling. Um, so, um, and also patients that had mutations in any of this pathway also had a, a great benefit um, of median progression-free survival of about 7.3 months, and you know, it, it's looking like it's probably improving the amount of time that, that patients live as well, but that data is still pending. Now, one of my passions and one of the things that I think about a lot is, okay, great. So it, it stopped your breast cancer from progressing for a couple more months, but at what cost to you? What are the side effects? Um, and, and that's always something that you should be asking your doctor about. Is the juice worth the squeeze? Is three to seven months worth the side effects, uh, essentially? Um, and, you know, this drug was better tolerated than Picre, I will say. You know, Picre is the one that has, you know, the diabetes, the rash, um, the, the kidney issues, all of that. So, so those things happen to a much less degree with this drug. Um, the one thing with this drug is that there is manageable diarrhea. So when this is approved, I'll be talking to my patients about, you know, taking Imodium as soon as you have diarrhea and all of that. Um, but a lot of patients had, there were certainly some patients that, that had diarrhea um, with this regimen. And this regimen is interesting. You only kind of a Monday through Thursday drug and you don't take it Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. So you take it four days on and three days off. Um, and this will go to the FDA sometime in the next six to 12 months and, and we'll find out about approval. So these are some things that I'm thinking about after my patients have progression on a CDK4-6 inhibitor. I wanna know about what are the mutations that are making up their breast cancer? Do they have a germline BRCA mutation? So are they a patient that, that has a hereditary BRCA mutation? Do they have a ESR1 mutation? Do they have a PI3 kinase mutation? Um, I also wanna know about their other medical problems. Do they have diabetes? Do they have a history of pneumonitis, heart history? And then what's also become more important is knowing how long they were on their CDK4-6 inhibitor. So, um, you know, were they on their CDK4-6 inhibitor for a long time, which would mean that maybe they'll still benefit from other endocrine therapies, or were they on it for a really short time, which makes us think that maybe they wouldn't benefit from other endocrine therapies. And then probably the most important point is, what are my patient's goals? Um, you know, what side effects are they okay with and are they not okay with? Um, and, and really having that discussion about what are the options together and, you know, what are the options and, and what's the most appealing to me? For instance, you know, sometimes when we're trying to decide between something like PICRE and chemotherapy, a lot of my patients choose chemotherapy after I run down all the side effects with them, um, especially if it's Zolota, which is oral and doesn't have hair loss. So, um, it's, it's very much a patient's choice as well, I would say. So this is kind of my algorithm for how I'll be thinking about, you know, second line choices once we have l and capavacertib approval. Um, and, you know, these would be the options that I'd be talking to my patients about. So another really um, new area in drug development and new treatments for patients with metastatic breast cancer are a class of drugs called antibody drug conjugates, which are rather new. Um, and what these are is it's, it's very targeted chemotherapy. So it's a molecule that has a antibody 
and it's an antibody to something. In breast cancer, it's generally an antibody to either HER2 or to uh, a protein called TROPE2. So there's an antibody, and then it's attached by a linker to a payload of chemotherapy. And what's really interesting about these drugs is whereas systemic chemotherapy just goes all through your body, these antibody drug conjugates, they find the protein that the antibody is trying to target, either the HER2 or the trope 2 and they're not, and then they're taken up into that cell when they find that protein on the cancer cell, and they don't release their chemo payload until they're taken up into the cancer cell, which is kind of a, it's, it's a very just kind of targeted way of trying to deliver chemotherapy. So in the last year, um, a new sort of therapy class has come about, and that is called HER2 low breast cancer. And we used to think of HER2 positive breast cancer as we look at the protein under the microscope, and if the protein is three plus, or if the gene is amplified above two, then it's positive. Otherwise, we thought it's negative. But now that we have in HER2 uh, or trastuzumab deruxtecan, which is a new drug that's so potent, it can target these low levels of HER2, we now have a new sort of class, what have you, of patients who would benefit. And that's called HER2 low. And so your HER2 low, if your breast cancer, HER2 protein level is one plus, and this would be on any PATH report. All PATH reports should have this information on it. If your HER2 is one plus, then your HER2 low. If you're two plus, but your um, amplification is negative, um, then you're also considered HER2 low. And about 60% of hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer is HER2 low. About 35% of triple negative is, um, is HER2 low. Um, and so the reason why we care about HER2 low now is because of the Destiny Breast 04 clinical trial, um, where they looked at patients that have HER2 low breast cancer, so IHC 1 plus or 2 plus, um, who had been treated with one to two prior lines of chemotherapy in the metastatic setting. And the primary endpoint was actually to, actually to look at HER2 low hormone receptor positive patients, but they did also include some triple negative patients. And they randomized the patients two to one to receive TDXD, which is in HER2, which is this antibody drug conjugate that targets HER2 or physician's choice chemotherapy, which you can see what the chemotherapies were below. It was either aribulin, capecitabine, which is the LODA, uh, nabpaclitaxel, which is a braxane, gemcitabine, or taxol. And the primary endpoint was progression-free survival again. And you can see here that the patients that got TDXD did better than the patients that got physician's choice chemotherapy with a median progression-free survival of 10 months versus five and a half months um, with the regular standard chemotherapies. And what was also quite important about this trial is that the patients that got in HER2 lived longer um, in terms of their average survival. So um, not only did their disease progression, was it um, longer, they lived longer if they got in HER2. And so the FDA approved in HER2 for HER2 low, I would say about six months ago. So we've been using it in the clinic in the HER2 low setting um, for some time now. Um, and so this is something that you can get standard of care. Um, I generally give this, um, I, I give this, you know, similar to the trial design if the patient needs to at least have had one line of chemotherapy in the metastatic setting, and then I would give them this drug. Um, you know, there are just like there are side effects to any drug that we get, there are side effects in HER2 that your doctor will discuss with you. But, you know, in general, I would say, you know, there's some nausea and then there's a 10% 10 per, 10 risk of pneumonitis in the lungs. So um, that's something that we think about a lot as well.
And then there's another antibody drug conjugate called sasituzumab or Tridelvi. So Tridelvi is the brand name. And we've also found in the last year that Tridelvi also works better than physician's choice standard chemotherapy in hormone receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancer. Um, Tridelvi is already approved for triple negative breast cancer, and we generally give that in the second line and beyond. Um, and Tridelvi is also now being studied in HER2 positive breast cancer with uh, Herceptin. So we're really studying Tridelvi across the board. Um, as well as um, trastuzumab, deroxycan, you know, we're studying that across the board as well. But sasituzumab um, was better than standard chemo um, in this clinical trial, and it hasn't been FDA approved for hormone receptor positive breast cancer yet, but um, the approval is probably coming in the next six to 12 months. So this is how I think about chemo for hormone receptor positive HER2 negative patients. Um, generally in the, the first line for chemo, I'll give them either Zolota or Ataxane. And then second line and beyond, it's important to know what their HER2 status is. If they're HER2 low, then I will um, talk to them about trastuzumab deruxtecan or TDXD or in HER2. Um, and then there's, you know, if they're HER2 zero, I'll talk to them after a standard chemo about Tridelvi. Um, one interesting thing that we don't know yet in the metastatic setting is we don't know if sasituzumab works after NHER2 or if NHER2 works after Tridelvi. So, you know, studies are ongoing to kind of figure out how we should sequence them. But I would say that NHER2 for HER2 low definitely has a longer progression free survival than Trudelvi. Um, so that's for her too low. That's usually my first go-to as long as the patient, you know, is, is up for it. Um, now moving on to some, some updates in her two positive breast cancer, trastuzumab deruxtecan or in her two is now the standard of care treatment in the second line setting. Um, so uh, this is a clinical trial called Destiny Breast 03 that um, compared TDXD or in HER2 to TDM1 in patients who had progression on trastuzumab and ataxane. And essentially, what we saw over here on the left is the median progression free survival of TDXD in the second line in HER2 positive breast cancer was 29 months, so almost three years, whereas the median progression free survival um, for TDM1 was 6.8 months. So a really marked um, difference. And, and this can just kind of show you how potent this drug is in targeting HER2. So we are now generally using um, TDXD or in HER2 in the second line for patients who have metastatic breast cancer um, that is HER2 positive. And so this is kind of how we think about HER2 positive breast cancer now in 2023. Um, you know, patients that it, it has to do with, have you had any therapy before or not? So for patients that haven't had any therapy for their metastatic breast cancer before, or whose breast cancer came back and became metastatic more than a year after they completed Herceptin, the first line treatment is still ataxane and trastuzumab and pertuzumab. Whereas the second line treatment, you know, for patients that are just starting this algorithm would be in HER2. Third line treatment, um, you know, if you hadn't received in HER2, then it would be in HER2. Otherwise, we have a lot of other options. Tocotinib and trastuzumab and capecitabine is another regimen that has a lot of activity in HER2 positive breast cancer, and it specifically has great activity in patients who have brain metastasis. Um, so tocotinib is a very good option um, for patients that have brain metastasis. Um, for patients who relapse within 12 months of completing their Herceptin, most of us are moving to inher 2 in the first line setting um, with then tocotinib in, or TDM1 in the second line. And for patients that have brain metastasis, you know, these, 
ataxane, trastuzumab, pertuzumab is still a good first line option. But in the second line, either of these regimens has great activity in the second, third, or fourth line. So ticotinib, trastuzumab, keepsidibine, and trastuzumab, drastican, both have great activity in patients that have brain metastasis. Um, so many, many more options for patients with brain metastasis, which is good news. We're also learning more and more that this NHER2 or TDXD drug has a lot of activity in brain metastasis. So it, both in mouse models and in patients, we're finding that it can shrink brain tumors in the majority of patients. There's some um, data to say that it might also work in patients that have leptomeningeal disease, which is when breast cancer involve, invades the the um, cerebrospinal fluid around the spinal cord. Um, we're seeing some promising activity there as well. But we're really excited about in HER2 in patients with both HER2 positive and HER2 low brain metastasis. Studies are ongoing in the HER2 low brain metastasis um, to really understand its impact, but um, we're definitely hopeful. Um, and then in terms of antibody drug conjugates, there's a lot more that are being studied. So we talked about trastuzumab, deruxtecan, or her 2 We talked a little bit about Tridelvi. These are just some other, these are some other ones that are in development, um, which is really exciting in clinical trials. So hopefully more options coming down the line. And then I did just want to add a few slides on brain metastasis in general. Um, when a patient, um, whether or not you develop brain metastasis is kind of, your risk of that is dependent on um, the type of breast cancer that you have. So for hormone receptor positive patients, the risk is around 15%. For HER2 positive breast cancer patients, the risk is around 30 to 40%. For triple negative breast cancer patients, the risk is around 30 to 40%. Um, and so when we identify a new brain metastasis, usually it's because the patient is telling us they're having symptoms, they're having headaches, vision changes, you know, an array of neurological things that your doctor might suggest ordering a brain MRI. And usually the first treatment, if you have um, a limited number of brain metastasis, you know, less than 10 or so, um, it really is up to the radiation oncologist, but usually radiation will be the first step. Um, there are caveats to all of this, and there's uh, treating brain metastasis is very nuanced. And in general, you should see a medical oncologist and a radiation oncologist. Um, the only patients that go for surgery are the ones that have really big brain metastasis, or maybe they just have one. Um, and, and they, they might be considered for resection, um, but it's pretty rare to do, um, surgery on the brain. As you can imagine, it's a, a pretty invasive procedure. And then doing some sort of systemic treatment after your brain metastasis, um, is treated with radiation, we know is very important. We know that going on systemic therapy after you've had a brain metastasis does improve both the time until your next brain metastasis and survival for most patients. Um, and these are some of the, the treatments, you know, the treatment for patients with um, brain metastasis is really still dependent on the subtype of breast cancer that you have. So whether or not you have estrogen positive breast cancer or HER2 positive or triple negative, and it depends on what you've had before, an array of biomarkers. But I, I did just wanna note that there are many options for patients that do have brain metastasis um, and also many clinical trials that are ongoing.